Hello, everyone, and welcome to, are we at episode five already? My goodness, we just started last week of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed, and I do have my sound on this time. So I apologize for the Joe Flanagan interview. I started without my sound. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, we have a couple of very special guests, some friends of mine who have been uh, working tirelessly on developing the Stargate SG-1 role-playing game. Brad Ellis and Wesley Walker of Wyvern Gaming are joining us now to answer some of my questions and take a few of yours. So we've got Summer and Tracy in the chat. Please submit one question for Brad and Wes regarding the role-playing game, regarding science fiction, life, the universe, and everything, preferably the role-playing game. Uh, but before I bring them in, let me let you know how you can help the show. If you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it mean a great deal to me if you click that like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my text notifications or video notifications more than likely of any last Last minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days in both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. Not trying to spam y'all, just showing highlights of the show so you can share uh, the more specific bits with your friends. I want to show you something extremely cool. Wyvern Gaming has published this announcement trailer for the upcoming SG1 role playing game. Roll tape! You've come from all over the galaxy. You represent the best of your people. Jaffa, Tokra, Tolan, Unas, Langarans, Atorans, and the men and women of the United States Air Force. You're here for reasons all your own. Some of you inspired by the heroes of the Tauri. Some of you to uncover the past or explore the future. Others finally having that chance to fight for your freedom. Whoever you were, why ever you're here, that's behind you now. We rise up against a common enemy, and that enemy has made us brothers and sisters. Any differences your races may have, put them aside. You're all members in Stargate Command. And you are... Phoenix. The Stargate SG-1 role-playing game is a sci-fi tabletop game where you assume the role of an SG team member for a top-secret off-world Stargate command labeled Phoenix Sight. As a member of Phoenix Sight, you and your teammates will go on missions guided by a Gate Master to explore new worlds and cultures, obtain new technologies, and fight to preserve freedom across the galaxy. The Stargate SG-1 role-playing game is currently under development and the game rules are based on the 5th edition open gaming license. Backing this project will make you among the first to join the Stargate Command at the Phoenix site. The galaxy needs you. Join now. Brad Ellis, Wes Walker, Wyvern Gaming. Welcome, fellas. Thank you. Hello. Glad to be here. Very Thanks. nice. So I didn't even know that you were producing that. That's how out of the loop I've <laughs> been. You know, I, I helped with the with the editing. I did the forward. And then you guys produced this thing. And I was like, 
What, what is this? This is so yeah. cool. It is one of the coolest videos I've ever seen for a Stargate property ever. And I've seen a lot of that content. So bravo. Golf claps to you. Appreciate that. We're, well done. we're sly that. like that. We're sly like it that. It was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually, uh, this is part of the, the, the super fan group that we've got with this with the Stargate game. This community has really come together. The group that uh, actually put that video together is called the Opposition Party. Um, plug them real quick. They're Noah uh, over there at, at their, their team. Um, help us put that together. So we really wow. appreciate what the work they did. I love yeah. I that the the approach that you took for it it was because it's it's a static model in front of you if you get to play with people in person and the video has a little bit of move it has the camera is movement you know mm -hmm. just like our eyes are move, moving over the board when we play so it kind of does a little bit of of both you know it kind of sets up an expectation of how the gameplay will be if you know you're you're lucky enough to be in person with someone when this disaster is all over with playing uh with physical models as opposed to uh, also playing online so it's very yep. well done thank you thank you and and a little little behind the scenes stuff uh each of the scenes that you see kind of snippets about with the different characters they all have backstories Wow. So I want to so, I want to talk about some of those. So, gentlemen, can you introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I'm, my name is Brad Ellis. I'm CEO of Wyvern Gaming. Um, I kind of do a lot of the, the sales, marketing and uh, project management, those kinds of things. It's my role. I'm Wes Walker. I'm the COO and I pretty much do everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the jack of all trades in the company. How long has yeah. Wyvern been around? Uh, since 2015 is was when we start, first started our first game. And what was that? So we did a uh, Cthulhu uh, deck building game. So um, it's a uh, it's a one to six player cooperative uh, card game where you play together to try to defeat the Elder Gods. Okay, so yeah. so we're talking like um, uh, what what are what are elder gods? <laughs> so are oh, we talking okay. like, um, I don't know, like God, God? Or are we talking like Egyptian gods? Cthu no, no. Cthulhu, like the, the sea Cthulhu. monster? Okay. Yeah, it's Cthulhu, yeah. The, the, monster, the, the picture you always see with the monster coming out of the sea with the tentacles coming off his face. Yeah, especially associated with 2020, right? It, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I think I have them in December. Um, <laughs> I have aliens for November. So. All right. So. <laughs> Wes, what do you got? <laughs> I'm 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 good for now. I've, I've dealt with enough. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? All right. And uh, how was that first one received? Uh, very well. Um, it was um, it was our first game out of the gate, and it it uh, did really well actually. And there's a lot of following for Cthulhu uh, mythos things in particular, H.P. Lovecraft and, and and that genre, kind of the 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 cult horror, um, pulp horror, if you will. Um, and it, it went off really well. That really set off our company, if you will, uh, to, to go where we, we, start, we, we started going. So um, that first year, we, we made a, um, a, a stint at Gen Con. Mm. And from there, it's, it's been a wild ride ever since. The, the company's really taken off. What other titles? Yeah, this, this no, go ahead, from please, our, uh, From our like, extensive background as gamers, um, you know, we, we wanted to build a card game. We grew up. Uh, there are members of our team that aren't in this call, um, uh, notably uh, Philip Lawyer. He's no longer with us, but uh, he was um, uh, the main foundation of the company at the time. And um, we gamed as kids. I mean, we're in our 40s now, but as kids, we all gamed together with each other. And we had games that we loved. And we knew how we would like to make it in order to make it better or what, what kind of games we could make uh, that people would like. And uh, that's where we came up with the, uh, the card building game. Yep. So the mechanics, like we, we, had, we had strong foundation when it came to the mechanics of the game because of the games that we've played before. So. Well, you know what works, you know, you're a fan. Right. And that's the best kind of, of, of product as far as I'm concerned, because you, you care about the product and it's not just something that you're doing for a paycheck. And it's something that, you know, that, you know, that other people 
who uh, are of similar caliber of you will probably enjoy it because you enjoy it. Exactly. So, yep. Does uh, Stargate fit comfortably into these titles, uh, the other titles that, that you haven't uh, mentioned that you've done, or is this kind of out of left field? I, go ahead. <laughs> um, it's First of all, it is out of left field, but on top of that, uh, we have ways of tying them together. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Actually. Interesting. All right. I know General Lawyer. Uh, that's the one. Yeah. He's he's yeah. very much has a presence. So Phil, Philip does. So that's really cool. I didn't even know that until we were on a call recently. And I was like, PK Lawyer, that's very specific. Is that named after someone? And then I learned about the history of the company and everything. Yeah. That's really a really a cool nod. Yeah. General Lawyer is, is a homage to our, our late friend who, who passed away. Um, and he's he's actually been a character in i think just about all of our games uh, all except for onami i think i think it's the and only short one order there. hero and short order hero yeah he wasn't in that one either uh but he's he's got a, a through line of uh, uh some backstory that uh, one day we hope to do a really fun game uh with well absolutely and congratulations on achieving your goal in on kickstarter in what three hours was it three hours and 45 minutes it was something yeah. absurd were you expecting yep. that kind of a response? Hopefully. We were hoping for that kind of response, uh, but obviously very pleasantly surprised that it actually came through. Um, and it's it's still going. I mean, every morning I wake up, I go to sleep at one number and I wake up in another number and I'm like, wow, wow, I can't believe it moved that much. As you're watching it throughout the day, because I'm like, I'm like always <laughs> on it right now. Um, it doesn't feel like it's growing as fast as it should, but then when you go away from it for a few hours and come back, it's like, wow, I can't believe that, that this is going this well. So helps put things in perspective a little bit. What what are we at now, guys? Uh, one sixteen eight hundred. So yep, one hundred sixteen thousand eight hundred. And we've we've unlocked five uh, stretch goals already. We've okay. got one thousand eight hundred and forty seven backers. And that, we know there's more Stargate fans than that. I, I <laughs> for sure. We have about ten thousand signed up on our website. Come on, so, guys, yeah. where are you? Where are you? Do your part <laughs> for the team for the Phoenix site. Absolutely. Oh. Wow, that is that is still stellar. And uh, the uh, is it the twenty eighth? That's the final day. I believe the 29th. 29th. Excuse we have, me. We have eighteen days to go. Mm -hmm. Wow. As, the, as of the recording of this. Well, a lot of well, the, the folks who are yeah. in here, uh, I'm hoping, have never uh, been exposed to this type of entertainment before. And we're going to talk about that in the, the interview that we're about to do. We're going to talk about the absolute mayhem fun that we're going to be having exactly 144 hours from now, however long a week is. I think it's 144 hours. Next week, next Sunday at 2 oh, yes. p.m., uh, East at 2 p.m. Pacific time, we are going to have six amazing Stargate cast members to sit down to do a playthrough of a Stargate SG-1 role-playing game experience. And I was going to bring this up later, but I think it's just important to get it out of the way now, how cool this is a thing that's coming. We've got David Blue, David Hewlett, Julie McNiven, Simone Bailey, Rainbow Sunfranks, and Alexis Cruz from the feature film. This is an insane lineup, and they're going to simulate an off-world mission. Is that right? That's right. That is yeah. correct. Can you preview it for us? I really don't want to. I don't want to give away, <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> don't want to give away the story. Uh, but know that, that they will be visiting things that probably are a little familiar to them. Oh, really? As people, not... Um, as characters. <laughs> well, no, I mean, they're not going to be playing necessarily anything like their characters. I mean, David Hewlett, for crying yeah. out loud, played an Unas. So I'm interested know, to see if hilarious. he brings the Unas back. That was really rolling yeah. into oh, every situation. Oh, I'm sure. That I'm was sure so you funny. Will. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how long have you guys been Stargate fans? And tell me about your your fandom experience. Uh, wow. Um, well, I was not fortunate enough to see the motion picture at, at on the big screen, but uh, uh, I've told this story before. But uh, so my aunt was a big blockbuster fan, uh, and back in the day when there was blockbuster video, and uh, anyway, it, it had come out for sale at blockbuster video, and she bought it, and I took it and watched it numerous, numerous times that summer, 
Um, and at that point in time, I was kind of hooked. I loved this this film. And then uh, we did not have um, Showtime, so we, I wasn't able to watch the original run. But when it came on Sci-Fi, uh, I mean, ah. I was just hooked. I was hooked. And of course, when Atlantis came out, like I was, I was waiting for it. I was waiting for that premiere. And when it when it hit, I mean, we we just every every week. Uh, Phil and I, we would call each other and we'd kind of talk about the episode and what happened. And it was just our thing. Uh, so for, for Phil and I, when, when we talked about going in to making the game for Stargate, it was like, wow, you know, would we really be able to do this and like give it justice? And, um, you know, I, I still struggle with, you know, I feel like we've given it justice, but you know, it's just a, such a high bar, <laughs> I but yeah, for forever. I didn't realize the general himself was a fan of this property. You guys aren't just placing, you know, a friend and colleague into this game, uh, part into part of this world. You're placing a Stargate fan in there as well. That's Absolutely, cool. Yes. That's Absolutely. really cool. What, uh, Br- Brad? Yeah. So uh, I did see the the motion picture in in theater, um, and I loved it. It was it was it was it was all striking when I watched it. It was up there with you know all the other star named franchises <laughs> in my mind. Um, and like Wes, I didn't have showtime, so I, I missed the, the first run of, of, of the first part of that, but then I caught up to it later and I've loved it ever since it's been, I, I think, uh, Richard Dean Anderson just plays a, a wonderful Jack O'Neill. He's probably my favorite character and uh, he made it his I own just, for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you had to follow up Kurt Russell, which I mean, that's a pretty pretty tough thing to do but he did it children of the gods there's you 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 definitely see the kurt russell like mentality there and then he's beginning to morph the character as he moves forward so yeah it was pretty successful wes your any uh particular character was your favorite uh it's a it's a it's still a runoff between mckay and uh carter so but uh i'm leaning toward mckay but it, it's still it's still like 50 50 it's always going to be that way probably from here on out i mean originally um i was a i was a jackson fan uh and you know it just kind of graduated into the more sciencey uh, type of area so yeah I, I i really attached to those characters what makes stargate good for adapting to a game like this the gate uh definitely the the ability to be able to walk through so so usually in a game you're stuck in whatever realm that particular game is held in um so if it's a a middle ages or dark ages period or a renaissance period you're always stuck in that period or that setting um the gate gives you the uh, opportunity to be able to go to different um areas and different time frames and settings and you know you can you can be in a medieval setting and 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 all of a sudden step through the gate and now you're in a futuristic setting so that just for role playing that that just opens the doors so opens the gates (laughs) (laughs) absolutely brad can you add to that uh no that's that's uh that's really close to what i was going to say it's and also the the modern sci-fi um world is is really fun thing to, to to put yourself in and also the fact that they're they're cohesive teams that are formed uh as part of you know what is in the stargate program when you perform a, a stargate team that's your that's your group so just like that you're a gaming party going on adventures so it's 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 like it's very easy to translate that from the show to the game itself i think that that's it, yeah Wes, go ahead it's it's almost like uh, when they created Stargate, they thought about the game first. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I was talking with Joseph Malazzi yesterday, and he revealed – I'd never heard this. I've known the man for years. And he revealed that he and his writing partner, Paul Mully, were playing Dungeons & Dragons years before they ever started um, uh, writing on Stargate. So Good. the core of that experience I, – I couldn't believe it. I was like – why can I not believe it? Because that makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. that, that adds up. The team dynamic. You have a group of people working together who drive each other nuts to, to achieve a goal a, for the greater good, 
to save lives, to save themselves, to save one of the team. You know, there's there's a save lot Earth. of to save the Earth. You know, to save <laughs> uh, save us all. Uh, and it just it really um, it really makes sense. How far back were you guys uh, talking about doing this? Is this something you've wanted to do a Stargate title for a few years now? And you approached MGM. When was when when was the impetus? And uh, take us forward. Hey, uh, yeah, I'll take it. So, uh, yeah, we're both looking at each other like, who's going to take it? <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so we knew that we wanted to do a role-playing game. Um, it actually started there. We knew uh, from the titles that we had done so far, uh, Phil really wanted to, to go into actually a deep role-playing game. So uh, we started thinking about, you know, what are the properties that make sense? And we literally, we were, we were, looking at each other and we just we just turned all of a sudden and said Stargate. And it just made sense right from the start. And so we we put our, our business proposal together and we submitted it and uh, we were blessed that it that it actually got got accepted and here we are. Wow. Wow. And Wes, you were saying that you um uh you do everything that Brad doesn't in this process. Uh, what 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 were Well that um... was a that was a little bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> there are other folks. Uh, <laughs> um we have Sam Lawyer. She's uh, she's Phil's wife, and um, she's uh, basically heads up our customer support and customer service. Uh, big big role in the company, actually. I mean, uh, yeah. she's a gamer. Know, kudos too, to her. Obviously. She's yeah yeah she's a gamer too. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, like, uh, are you asking what my other roles? So are, you so or? you get the license. <laughs> So you get the license to move forward. Yep. Uh, Wes, what was your next step? Oh, wow. Um, development. You know, going in and, um, you know, trying to make sure that we're accurate with what we're – because there are a couple of us that are um, the the knowledge-based portions of the team as far as the knowing the Stargate um, – The lore. And the lore and the mm – -hmm. you know, all of that and uh, a lot of mine was lore based. Got it. Yep. And um, unfortunately, right when we got the license, that's when our friend Phil passed away. Um, oh, really? It's that recent? Yeah, oh, it was. Oh. Um, uh, and we were fortunate enough to to have uh, some good contacts, and we we got uh, Mac Martin, who's had um, he's got a lot of a, a role playing game. Uh, development experience. He's worked on uh, Malifaux RPG. He's uh, worked at Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, he's worked on some other star type properties. Mm. Uh, won't be naming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we were we brought him in on the project, um, and then we started looking at all the different ways we could go. And we looked at you know what are the what's the game system we actually want to use under the cover, and there's there's lots of different role playing type uh, games out there. There's there's Fate, there's D6 type systems. There's obviously the D20, which is used in Dungeons and Dragons. And this is, these are different started, modes of playing tabletop games, right? With these different are, rules, diff right? Different okay. base rule sets, if you will. Okay. Um, so we we knew that we wanted to go down. After some analysis, we decided that you know D20 was the best one for us. Uh, one, we're most familiar with it as an internal team. And we've also, uh, we've had many years of experience playing it. And we knew the things that really excited us about playing that particular uh, type of, of role-playing game. Um, so we uh, went down that road and we started bringing in other mechanics from other game systems that uh, we really enjoyed. And Mac Martin has done a, a wonderful job um, just really getting those things melded together. and. Um, I just, I'm just so excited about uh, the product, and I can't wait for everybody to, to see what it is and how well it works together. Because um, we, we really scooped out. So D and D, it's, it's got magic in it, right? But we know Stargate is more about technology. Yeah. So having to replace magic with technology is, is kind of a big, it's a big thing, right? Because if you look at the, if you look at the Dungeons and Dragons rulebook, like a good portion of it is, is spells. So we had to, to we had to reimagine how that would work in a, a modern sci-fi type setting, and um, I think we did it. I how, think we pulled it off. How tricky sure. was oh, that yeah, yeah. conversion? 
Um, well, Mac would be the one to talk to okay. in detail about that. Maybe one day we can have him yeah, on. Yeah, certainly. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, it was it was a lot of testing, a whole lot of testing. We we spent uh, times we would tweak something, go play a game, and you know playing a game is like you know it's like a commitment. It's like a three hour type of stint. So every little tweak and test, it's a lot of time to go back and forth. So there was a lot of that that happened. Uh, we would add new rule systems in. We would replace things with others, and um, uh, eventually we came to the place that we that we got there and. At some point, we, uh, I believe it was no, last November or October, we opened up the uh, private beta. Correct. So we had the great opportunity to bring in some, some Stargate fans, some um, role-playing fans, and bring them into the project, uh, into our Discord uh, channel server. And that community is just wonderful. I cannot say enough good words about the folks that have joined us on this journey from from way back then to to really help mold a game that that is what we're producing so yeah this is a this is a game that's essentially it's a game that's made by fans and gamers for fans and gamers and uh like brad said um if it was not for our our discord folks like those guys uh, all of them are their gold. They've they've helped us mold and fine tune and tweak. I mean, just absolutely the the best game. Um, and uh, on top of that, you know, Brad was also saying that we have taken the best parts of other games. We've also added some new features that are not in other games as well. This is just totally new stuff. Can you give me an um, example? And we've gotten a phenomenal response on that. Moxie. Uh, Moxie. Moxie is probably one of the biggest things. So usually in a role-playing game, when you come into an encounter, you will roll initiative. Uh, this is basically telling you what turn order you're going to take, depending on your skills. And this is well, with the 20-sided die. Yes, it's okay. with the 20-sided die. To determine so, that. Yeah. Correct. So um, usually this is, this is going to say, it, it's like a dexterity-based thing. Well, you know, when you're in a negotiation, dexterity has nothing to do with a negotiation unless you want it to go south. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you're going to be looking you're going to be looking for charisma in, say, a situation of negotiations. Um, so Moxie, so that person that's better at negotiating actually will have the ability to try and go first now because they should have a better role. Uh, with this moxie role. So basically it's initiative, but for social encounters. Yep. Interesting. Um, now we also, I know, I know Brad was talking about uh, Mac on the game development, but uh, one of our main artists, um, Wayne, he's, he's a phenomenal artist too. Um, Wayne and Miller. Uh, Wayne Miller, he's going into the, uh, the inspiration of the project, you know, Phil used to, ask for a piece of art first to inspire him on how to make a certain mechanic in the game. Um, mm. So, which, you know, which there's is not the right way to do it from a cost perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From a inspire cost perspective, me, yeah, definitely not. Uh. But, but really like it, it, uh, it, it does help, you know, it, it having a good artist helps the, the project uh, for its mechanical development. Yeah. So, Usually, usually it's in reverse, but yeah. Anyway, did Wayne create the uh, background behind you? Uh, no, actually, this is one that I created. You uh, did this. That's very cool, man. Yeah. Let me have to have we've you got, create some stuff for my show. So. We've, there's we've there's got, plenty of. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, because we're we're kind of a small company. We we do have we have some good skills amongst the the team. I would say uh, uh, Wes's ability to do uh, 3D renderings is is one of the his, his strong points. Um, I, I also do a lot of the graphic design. So a lot of the layouts and things like that, that's, that's usually coming from me. You do wear a lot of hats guys. Uh, wow. Well, yeah. done. you got, you have to, you know, you have to make, Absolutely. The, make the project work. What are, um, the franchises more thought provoking dilemmas story-wise that they have tackled, which really resonate with you? The, the moral ambiguity situations that the team are, are placed in the the internal conflict between characters, maybe between governments. Um, 
what really what really resonates with the two of you? Wes, you want to go first? <laughs> that uh, you managed that you managed to insert into the the DNA of the game. Gosh, making that even harder. Oh, yeah, I, really. <laughs> I hope to make it easier. Okay, um, for instance. So okay, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, give me give us a give us a, an example. Here. So we we played uh, for San Diego Comic Con. A situation mm-hmm. where uh, th- there was there was a child that was in trouble on this alien planet, yep. and but also there was a situation that I was placed in while we were playing, where I had a friend, one of one of my peers, who got injured, and I can either waste is not the right word, I expend my turn on helping the friend or helping the child who's in yep. danger. That is a a macro or a micro example of what of similar situations that take to, that carry themselves out in Stargate all the time. You have a limited amount of bandwidth. You can only save one person. Yeah. Uh, it may be like with the Encarens and the Gadmir in season four. You know which species do you save? You know it's situations like I that. I, I found myself placed in, and I was like. Not only am I surprised to be having this kind of an encounter, but I was like, that's kind of cool from an existential perspective when you pull back. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that's that's really what a lot of role-playing games is about, is putting your, your player characters in those types of situations. The reason we were struggling with answering that question is because mechanics-wise, uh, it's the book has you know, got a good portion of the book. We were thinking of the mechanics of the game, how it may have okay. done, done that, but... Really, the portion of the book that that you're talking about is our uh, gate master chapter. So this is this is talking to the people who are creating the stories, who are who are molding the adventures that the the mission, the teams are going on. Um, and it really speaks to one of the the. This is like Max was like when he came presented this to us. This was like, oh, of course we should do it this way. So the. Uh, the gate master chapter we present in a way uh, where we give the advice of the, the to the gate master that you should make up your stories like you're making a tv show so you are making a season of episodes that are going to play out uh, episodes that are going to play out over over a season and each of those episodes have scenes so you think through how you would make a tv show essentially and putting your characters in those moral type situations, um, whether they need to make those, those hard choices. Um, if they, if they're going to save the planet or they're going to save the child kind of thing, those, those kinds of things are, are that whole chapter gives advice on how to create great, um, TV, TV shows. Suspense and it's like McKay brings up the, the railroad track dilemma. You know, yeah. Right. That's, uh, now, see something too is we have our living series, and we have our writers for our living series. And this is throughout our season arc of our series. Uh, we're actually on development of uh, season two, um, but there's all sorts of these moral dilemmas in our season arcs. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So just just to be clear, what what he's talking about. Please. So there's two. So the core, the thing that's on the Kickstarter right now is, is we're kickstarting the core rule book. So okay. this is the, the base rules that you need to basically be able to create a character, um, teaches you how to, to be the gate master, like I was just talking about. So it's all the base rules that you need to play the game. And then the living series um, is episodes that we are producing as Wyvern Gaming uh, that's going to be over the course of seasons in episodes. So there are going to be ad- little adventures that, that we put out there that allow your, your characters that you make from the book to play through. Now, you don't necessarily have to play it that way. Through our living series, you can also just take the book and play it as a home campaign, meaning you have you and a group of your friends that show up to your house every week or virtually online mm-hmm. in this day and age. Um and you play with that same group week after week, and there's one gate master who's telling the story through that season. With the living series, what it is is you have you have stories, and you may have a gate a different gate master from week to week, depending on uh, which table you show up at. Wow. Okay. Right. It, so- it allows you. It's a it's a campaign setting uh, for organized play. So it allows you to go from not only 
uh, switching up your home brew, uh, home brew team as the GM, but also you can go from state to state, convention to convention, uh, sit down at a table, and if you've done everything correctly, your character, character sheet, equipment, skills, everything Translates. will be honored at that table. It's not just, oh, well, I last night I created a level five character and you know, no, it's, it's, you actually have proven that you've gotten to this progress, that you've put these years into this character to get to where it was. Uh, okay. So the, the core rule book that's coming out, are there missions in it? Uh, not, not directly. No. Okay. Uh, however, there is a stretch goal, um, I believe. Yep, it was unlocked last night. <laughs> so it's <Yep>. already done. <laughs> and what's that goal? Uh, we, we're producing uh, the Phoenix Site Side Mission 1. So this is, uh, this is going to be an actual episode that we, we're giving free to our backers uh, who have uh, done the SG2 reward level or higher. Is this physical? Uh, it is. It'll, that particular adventure will be sent out as a PDF. Ah, the, understood. Obviously, the the book itself is physical. Okay, so the book itself is that intended for uh, for game masters specifically, or is it in intended for anyone who's wanting to make a character? That's for uh, players and game masters. Both. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. Third in D and D, in D, D, they they do split them up. There's a there's a player's handbook, and then there's a dungeon master's guide. This is essentially both of those things squished together. So I buy oh, the and, and a bestiary. Yes. It's got it's got the life forms that are in it as well. Oh, that's cool. All right. So, so it's got all three elements there. I actually know some of this, folks, but I'm I'm just feigning ignorance for your education. So <laughs> so I get the book. I study up. You know, I get my friends together. We want to pick a mission. Where do we go to do it when everything's when everything's rolling? So if, if you back the campaign, you'll have this, this side mission in hand. So one of you, one of your friends, uh, maybe probably the person that, that probably backed the campaign because you're, <laughs> right. you're the one interested in it, um, will get their, their players to create a character, and then they'll take that, that episode that is coming with, with, the, uh, with, with the Kickstarter, and you can, just, you can just start, sit everybody down at the table and start reading. And what you'll have is, is an episode that, that will put the characters through a, a test so to speak. And future episodes, are they going to be available on a specific website where you can log in? Absolutely. Yeah. So Stargate, the RPG.com Stargate, the RPG.com. Um, that's right. Correct. So if you, you can go there now, sign up, um, you can actually create a character there already. Um, it's really basic right now. We did unlock uh, one of the other stretch goals we unlocked was a digital online character sheet. So it's going to let you actually, uh, build your character on our website as well. So you'll actually be able to choose your class, your race, and your abilities um, through that tool. And that will be the, the character that you can use uh, yeah. in, in your gaming. I did this for a Star Wars uh, character. I unlocked, I, I built, I developed a droid. And boy, was I happy that, that such a document existed. So I'm really, really glad helps. that that was unlocked. <laughs> so yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah, there's there's one thing about having a book and, and reading it and understand you know understanding what it is and taking paper and pen and start creating a character versus like there's an something to be said for sheet. that. Yeah, yeah, it, it really yeah. helps. Wes, now we've also got our uh, on roll twenty. We've got a creation of a character sheet there as well. Now roll twenty is a separate website. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now we're not just talking about when you say roll twenty. That also is well, slang of, for rolling a die, right? Well, no, <laughs> yeah. because of uh, okay. because of say COVID. Uh, now we've yeah. been using Roll Twenty for years. He's asking uh, what Roll Twenty is. Basically. Yeah, I, I, I know, but right. uh, but like because of COVID, the popularity has become stronger, and the need for social distancing when it comes to role playing and gaming. Um, the it's online Roll Twenty sheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's it online gaming. You. It's it's the ability to play this game online. Uh, so okay, and the online environment that we were using with with the uh, map view of the planets was that where will where will that be found? That was that was roll twenty. That was roll twenty. So, okay, understood. So you have an account there, or how does that work? Yeah, so you you go to roll twenty dot com or okay. dot net, I think maybe it's dot net, I think. Yeah, so you go there and you sign up and you log in and it's it's actually got a video feed and a um a dot net feed and everything. Okay, yeah, that, and so you. on that space, will the the Wyvern uh, Stargate maps be held, or will they be available elsewhere? 
no no the um so the the map so as a as a gate master you would create the game within the roll20.net interface understood and and you would upload the maps and things ah uh, so those were just us for the demo yes correct understood i did not know that okay now i'll say that uh we do have a stretch goal <laughs> uh when we reach uh 150 uh in pledges we're going when, to unlock not if when <laughs> we're going to unlock the phoenix site map tiles so these are this is going to be a pdf of a full color detailed playable grid of maps uh that you can use to go on episodes with um and those particular things in particular in, in particular you can upload to roll20.net and uh use for your backgrounds or your characters to to play on the on the interface guys uh, uh, not you guys but guys out there in the viewing uh audience i cannot think of a better reason to hit that stretch goal right there because when we were playing um it's important to be able to imagine to use your imagination when you're playing at the same time because we're all spread out in many cases just like the characters did in sg1 it's so handy to be able to see on a map where the heck you are in relation to everyone else because it keep it 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 saves that those precious seconds that you're using in your moments of gameplay and in planning before it's your turn to help you determine how you're going to move next so that's that's a a just uh goal to unlock absolutely that's that's a good reason to go to kickstarter and, and hit that goal because if sure. you do plan on playing it's it will help immensely yeah, I, we, we prefer to play with maps. Uh, there are there are a lot of role players that don't use maps, but we, we prefer to play with maps. Yeah, and and the game was designed from from fifth edition open gaming license, which is D and D. Uh, the Wizards of the Coast put out this this open gaming license, which is basically a license to use their product um, in a in a basic way. Um, it was built to be theater of the mind, which is without maps, um, and you can totally play Stargate that way. In fact, it's it's actually a, a really good way to play it as well. Before uh, this year, I had never done anything like this. And Kieran and I, you know, when Kieran was still at MGM, we were talking with you guys about about uh, launching this uh, project, or developing it together. My only familiarity was a series called Community. There was a season two or season three episode called Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And I was captivated by it. It's a little, I don't, they don't necessarily use the, the the game configuration that we do. It's much more one character is just rolling a die and he's carrying out the whole story. But I cannot recommend enough. There's a sequel to it. Don't watch that one, but, what, but first watch, the, watch Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first. But you will see the experience of a group of people who had never played before sitting down and bringing an event, an adventure to life. In this case, a Stargate adventure. So I compl I cannot recommend that enough if if you're interested to see just how much fun you can potentially have. And in that case, they give you sound effects. Well, uh, I'm I'm really really looking forward to this next weekend to see that that group of of players playing. There's so much personality that's going to be in that playtest. Oh I'm God, just, yes, I'm going to be. Whew. It's going to be like herding <laughs> cats. I mean, they're going to be all over the place. It's like uh, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how much gaming will actually take place. <laughs> I don't know, but one way or another, it's gonna it's gonna be a hoot. So yeah, it'll be oh, fun. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Any unexpected yeah. issues that came up with this particular title in terms of game development that you did not expect, or was it really you know s systematic beginning to end? You know, this is this is this is pretty straightforward. Well, I'll say that we kind of expected this, but. Um... We've, we've worked hard to try to mitigate it. And that's the um, kind of the hit points problem with a modern sci-fi game. So when you're, when you have a group of, of a, a team that's carrying around guns and shooting them at each other, when you get hit with a gun, it, it really like does damage, right? Yeah. It so could kill you. It basically can yeah. kill you. <laughs> right. So a graze, deal with, you know, how often do you get a graze? So yeah, having to deal with it, like having a pool of hit points, hit points where you, you kind of lose it over a, a period of time after you've been hit a few times. Um, it's, it's really hard to put your head around because typically in, in the real world, once you get hit over the bullet once you're going down, 
So uh, the way Mac Martin has um, kind of uh, put it, and I think it's it's really a great way to put it, is is that your pool of hit points is not necessarily you getting hit like shot in shot in the arm, you know, 20 times. It is, you're getting near grazes. You're getting, um, dust blown in your face. You're, you're having all kinds of things until you get down to about half your hit points. Uh, you're just scuffed, meaning you have, you know, TV movie magic, you know, you're, you're, you have plot armor, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then, and then once you get to half and below you're wounded, so you may have been actually shot in the arm or something. And then when you get to zero, that's when you actually take that fatal blow. So if you have to, if you put your mind around it in that particular way, um, it, and this is advice that we give in the book and, and how to, to gate master uh, a particular game, but that particular power curve of uh, when to, how much hit points a certain character should have and the, the non-player character should have, um, was a was a challenge. It took a lot of testing and tweaking as we went. Mm-hmm. As some people may be asking, like fatal blow, you know, is isn't it? Can't, can't you just respawn? Depending on uh, how faithful you are uh, to the mechanics of this type of a system while you're playing, and how honorable you are as a human being, your character can be killed. I'm just yep, saying. Yeah. So there are consequences to actions. You know, if, yep, if yeah. all of you are playing the game in the spirit in which it is intended. So, and yeah, then you so, have to go off and make a new character. So <laughs> yeah, the way so that, the, go, yeah, go ahead. I, I was, was going to say, so something too that, that Mac has added is the tension die system. So uh, with the tension die, it is a D12 system. It, it ranges on say D4 being a more comical episode. There's not going to be any fatal blows. Uh, and then you have your D12 system, which would be like a series finale, where there's a possibility that you're not going to make those death safe throws. Stakes are real, realer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So each each episode that the gate master sets what what tension die it is and tells the players at the beginning of the adventure, uh, so they know what to expect. So are you going to have you know episode 200 type episode, or are you going to have you know the the season finale of you know season six or whatever? Um, so and anywhere in, and that dice is also used by the in the the combatants that you're fighting against um or in negotiations and things like that it's it's a dice that's actually rolled by the players and the the gate master so it it, it can really level uh level up the game if you will depending on on what's going on wow tell us about some of the new species that you're introducing uh-huh. Sure. We went round and round on this. What was it like? Eighteen months ago, sixteen months ago, about about this uh, the one species in particular that I'm thinking of. But go ahead. The Acheron. The Acheron. Yeah. So we we uh we really liked some of the higher up races, um, the uh, the Knox, the uh, the Tolan, the um, the Tokra, the Tokra, the um, Oh my gosh! Uh, the Lingarans? I'm like at a As, I'm like Asgard. at a blank right the now. Asgard. The Asgard, yeah. So so mainly mainly say the Nox and the Asgard. So these these races, they would not make a equal playing ground for everybody because of their advanced, uh, the way that they're so advanced. Well, we felt that uh, we liked the Nox enough where we could go ahead and. Um, make a similarity to the Nox, maybe a race that was uh, raised to be peaceful, uh, but they're curious, they're still young. So uh, we wanted to go ahead and create a race for that. So we created the Achurin. Um, And the Achurin have been basically nurtured by the Nox. They were a warring race. They were on the verge of self-destruction. The very young do not always do as they're told. Exactly, exactly. So um, they were like i'm saying they were nurtured they were taught how to respect their planet to respect each other but again still young still curious they wanted to go out and explore they didn't want to have a passive perspective uh like the Knox, uh because there is more to learn there's more to the universe than just hanging out at our planet well there's so there's, there's, there's factions there's factions there's houses within the Aturian world and each house that they have um, has different looks upon their their base code, moral code, um, 
and each house has a slightly different take on some of them are very staunch we are not going to we're very much pacifist and then there's others that are like wes was saying wants to adventure and wants to get out there mm -hmm. and uh people are probably wondering like why haven't we seen the Aturin in the tv show or anything like that as of yet uh, because we we really wanted it it was really important to us that we stay true to the canon of Stargate SG-1, right? And so when we uh, – there's some very uh, core elements, uh, story elements that are explained in, in our core rulebook. There's a whole settings chapter within the book that talks about uh, the Aturin in particular, uh, where they've been, why they haven't been discovered up to this point. It's and, a fair question. Um, yeah. Yeah. So – uh, we haven't covered this yet, but the 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 setting for the book we we started we started it at season six episode nine basically. Uh, I think it's Allegiance, is, if I'm not mistaken. Allegiance, yeah, that right. is correct. Okay, and um, <laughs> it's the oh, that was good. <laughs> uh, it's the point when basically the 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 Tokra and the Rebel Jaffa are starting to come together yeah. with the the Tauri, and they're they're really starting to to form these these alliances. Um, so at that point, what the United States government decided, this is where our story picks up. The government decided that we needed another base that we could bring together all the freedom fighters from across the galaxy to go on Stargate missions, similar to SG one, but, um, with the, this coalition, um, because we didn't want to bring them back to earth into you know, Cheyenne mountain because, um, that would be just, they're already busy. Earth. That's weird. Yeah. And yeah. aliens on Earth. Ah, don't want that. Right. right. We've already got a couple. <laughs> <laughs> so, Martin Lloyd, Tilk. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the Phoenix site was created, and our our team of, of Phoenix One, which is our iconic characters that are part of the, the game uh, and part of the setting chapter as well that's that's, that's out there, um, is, is made up of the various races, the Tok'ra, the Jaffa, uh, Tauri, obviously, uh, but humans in general. So it's not necessarily just humans from Earth, but it can be humans from all the other humanoid uh, mm -hmm. worlds. Uh, we have Unas, which was a really, really fun one to be able to add uh, as, a, as a playable race. And then, of course, this one that uh, Wes was just talking about, the Aturin. Uh, was added to the mix. The Aturin, I originally, uh, in our first uh, podcast, had brought up to Darren that it was a human race, and that was incorrect. It's they are actually they're, they they're pointy eared, right? Yes, and they have correct. their own they they are their own species, and they are kind of more or less safe to say your answer to the kind of elfkin is that correct? In terms of the direction that you guys were wanting to take, yeah, take, yeah, they're more than that. More the nature nature yeah. type character um, that is obviously peaceful. That's why the, the having them nurtured by the Nox made so much sense because that's kind of the direction we wanted to go. And uh, there's there's a little Easter egg in the name of the Aturin um, that I'm wondering if anybody will, will catch at some point. Aturin. <laughs> Try spelling it backwards. I'm sorry, it's not backwards. Not, it's yeah. Draw, it's an push, anagram. Push the end to the front. Puts the end to the front. Oh, for Pete's sake, you guys are bad. <laughs> I'll let everyone else online do that on their keyboards as well. It didn't occur to me one bit. And good for you to sticking with Canon in that, you know, you can't have a Nox. They wouldn't do it no. unless you no, had a no. rogue Nox. And even then, I mean, they'd still be so did, powerful. That playable. That there wouldn't be hundreds of them. Right. And you know, Brad so. Wright argued that the, it was his personal opinion that the Nox were the most powerful species in SG-1. So, Yeah, they yeah. can raise from the dead. Exactly. Absolutely, they, they can. They can be invisible. Yeah. The Asgard could on a couple of occasions as well. But, yeah, it's I'm not going to get into the minutiae there, the weeds. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's really cool to have that species along. And a lot of people may be like, well, if this is as big as, as you guys say it is, why didn't we hear about it? And... If you look at a season three episode of SG-1 uh, uh, where it's called Shades of Grey and Jack is talking to Daniel, there were other sites out there besides Alpha Site and Jack was supposed to command one uh, and it was going to be a big deal. And it's it was his excuse for for leaving the SGC to find the, the moles in in their midst. But 
we were talking, uh, a fan brought up with yesterday with, with Joseph Malazzi, all these different patches for the F-302, all these different groups, uh, squadrons for the F-302s. There was a ton of stuff going on that we don't even know about. We're just oh, seeing exactly. the top level of this operation. Millions and tens of millions of dollars spent annually on these things. It's entirely reasonable that this could be going on right under our notices, and they would never brought it up. And to... speaking, speaking of patches, that's another one of the stretch goals that was unlocked. You can <laughs> have a Phoenix site patch that, that you can use for your role-playing uh, outfit. Wow, that is terrific. Is it like a is it a sew on or is it like Velcro? Uh, it's well. a it's just a it's just a standard patch. Okay. Um, I do believe that uh, we're gonna try and make it iron on. Okay. But you, I mean, you could you could sew it on. You could have Velcro uh, backing on it. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're that's extremely cool, guys. Yeah. Will if any we're about it? Will any show characters appear in any of these missions at all? Is there even a chance of that? Can you not do that based on the license? Um, so, is that a, um, even a th can that even be a thing? So again, the the core rulebook itself it's it's not necessarily about you know Jack O'Neill, Samantha Carter, and, and right. crew. It's 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 setting up the the rules for the playing a role playing game in the SG one universe, and um, so. You create the characters. It's it's up it's up to you to create the characters. And if everybody created a Jack O'Neill, that would be, you know, kind of it doesn't make sense head canon wise. It doesn't make sense, right? Okay. Because you can't be Jack O'Neill. Jack O'Neill's Jack O'Neill, and he's already in this universe running around. So well, it's it's up to you to build, you know, to go in the core rulebook and make a character that is an SG team member uh, to play. By all means, if you're at a homebrew and you want to create SG-1 as your team for our game, you can do that. Sure. Uh, if you wanted to create a story uh, or a mission where Jack O'Neill is, uh, you're having to escort SG-1 on a, uh, through a, a forest or whatever um, on a mission, then you can do that for your homebrew. Um, you know, that's it, it, it's however you want to create it, however yeah. you want to run it. Understood. But as, but as far as our, our published missions or our episodes are going, um, there very well could be some some uh, known people show up. That's my answer. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. Reason enough yeah. to join in. How many players are optimal and what's the minimal number? So you need at least one gate master. So that's one person. And then at minimum, I feel like you need two players. Yeah, um, it, it would not be great to play one. You could play one. Don't get me wrong, but that's I've done it before. <laughs> I am God. Be the you do what I say. <laughs> right, yeah. right. I, I've had that before, but uh, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, optimally it's two as a minimum and six as a max. Um, five i feel like is is just a good table so uh five yeah. is probably the the optimal number yeah five mm -hmm. players and one gate master very good wow yeah. and a typical mission takes uh we we did it in two and a half three hours yeah so our episode yeah, yeah to really get into it and get into the story and things like that and we um, also created characters uh, in that time frame too so yeah yeah about three hours um and then from week to week, you can continue the same story, right? You Absolutely. Can, that's, you know, the first week is one episode. The next week you can have episode two and et cetera. And it carries on the entire season of your your version of uh, your Phoenix fight, Phoenix fight team. Absolutely. Guys, this has been such a treat. I want to bring in uh, some uh, uh fan questions from the live audience we've got 86 concurrent viewers right now thank you so much everyone who has tuned in to listen to us yap um this is a, a a truly outstanding product and i'm not just saying that because i you know was involved in editing and thank you i i got to write write the forward for it thank you so much that was such an honor um but it's a it's a really cool product and i i highly recommend going to the the kickstarter page for the sg1 role-playing game and checking it out uh the link thank will be you. below after the show so let's get into um some of the fan questions here 
I think some of them have already been covered. Will asked, did you get a license from MGM to make the game? That's Absolutely. kind of necessary. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that's step one. <laughs> step one. We don't been, want to get shot been, down. Uh, right. We've been uh, in correlation with MGM. I feel like Weekly. it's been daily. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, been daily. <laughs> Uh, from the beginning so yeah it's it's uh it's we've been working with mgm with this definitely scotty 0709 is there going to be a digital version of this game so we've already established that the episodes are going to be uh digital but i think they're talking about the the core rule book as well can you can you obtain it digitally yeah on there's, the, there's on the the kickstarter there is a pledge level uh that will give you the the pdf version the digital pdf version I think maybe he might be referring to if if we use like if we're going to do a virtual tabletop uh, adaptation okay. of of the adventures okay. and stuff like that. It's entirely possible. Um, as we produce the missions, uh, the episodes that that we have, um, it's very likely that we will publish them onto some of the more uh, famous or well known um, virtual role playing game uh, sites. Okay. But this isn't necessarily something that you would have in-house to build up on your own website with your own code and everything else. Uh, no, no. The okay. the actual play, the online tabletop things. That's that's well done by many other companies, and that's that's not what we're we're going to be building. Makes sense. We will we will build the the online uh, character sheet builder, which is because um, it's core to our game, and the hope is, and don't hold me to this is that we will have some export features that allows you to, to bring those into those other uh, game systems. Very cool. Teresa yep. McAllister, what would you see is an ideal number of people to play? So uh, say, like I was saying earlier, five would probably be five. The, well, six, one, one gate master and five players. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's ideal. And those of you who are worried about, you know, maybe getting the game and you can't think of any, anybody that you would play it with um there is an online community that is thriving to play these games online um if you go to stargatertheRPG.com, there's we have forums of of lots of people looking for players um and and just going to roll20.net there's there's places uh people looking for players so um, make some friends make some yeah. friends some digital friendlies you can, you can go to our discord there's plenty of people on our discord Mm -hmm. uh, but also, like Brad was saying, on the website, we have our groups, and you can go join a group, a gaming group. Yep. Discord is a um, is like a messaging service, like game integration system. It's it's a really cool feature. There's, it allows some chat and things like that. So it's yep. there's there's an app for that. There's an app. Exactly. <laughs> Jonas, do you intend to feature the ancients in some way? So in our uh, life forms chapter or or it could be in the gate master chapter I, have, I can't remember exactly we definitely do cover um the ancients or the ascended and also the nearly ascended mm -hmm. uh type type beings um those are those are mechanics and or advice on playing them because mm -hmm. truly they're they're kind of like gods if you will they yeah. can do anything so how do you write a mechanic for a god if, right. if, if yeah, you have to. It's all about boundaries. You have to establish yeah, some totally boundaries. Is. Yeah, I mean, obviously they have the non-interference thing that they have, uh, but beyond that, you know, writing rules for 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 ascended beings is is kind of you can't go there. But we do give some advice in the book about how to how to run those as a player, and also as a player, if if maybe you have um, that's your path. Maybe you're you're trying to become ascended. Um, that's a path that you may go on. Hmm. Talk about writing your character out of the game, though. <laughs> but still, I mean, <laughs> yeah. what an arc! Dan you know, hey, look at Daniel. Daniel Jackson. Daniel Jackson did it, and then Fun he fell. Did, so that's true and too. Then he fell. <laughs> <laughs> and they took all his clothes off and threw him on a planet. Spooky yeah. Trixie. How much SG knowledge do players need? I am a huge Stargate fan, but many people that I would want to play with me are not. That's a good question. Thank you, Spooky. Trixie. Yeah. Wes, you want to take that? I would have to say you don't need any if you if you get our core rule book rule book, you won't need any SG knowledge at all because everything that you need to play is in the book. 
it'll give you that background. It'll give you that knowledge. It'll give you new knowledge uh, from our story chapter. So uh, you don't really need to bring anything with you, but by all means, go watch the series uh, because yeah. it will definitely give you a better perspective and better idea of uh, the game style you're going to be representing. Hmm. Yep. And I also want to say the opposite too. If, if you have no game knowledge, like gaming knowledge at all, um, and you're just a Stargate fan, um, the book is also just, it's got a, a ton of information. It's got a settings chapter that that's going to be really fun to read. And, and, the mechanics for the re one of the core reasons we chose fifth edition was that it's it's a very easy for new players to user friendly very user friendly yeah um our one of our core tenets as wyvern gaming is approachable games for everyone so when we make games we try to make sure that you can sit down and start playing within 15 20 minutes and then it but it's a can be a complex game as as it goes because uh, but the the rules are simple and that's that's kind of like what fifth edition is. It's simple to get started and get going, but then it can be really complex if you want it to be. It grows with you. Yeah, yes. I mean, you you never have had to have done anything Dungeons and Dragons or anything like this before to make it work. Um, I can attest to that. Reading through the documentation, it's like I could sit down here and pick this thing up within like a half an hour or so. So, and you're learning as you go with the people as uh, and your peers as you go. So that's really cool. That's a that's a great thing about a cooperative game is you, if you have at least one person at the table that's played, you know, a, a D and D type game before, it's going to be really easy for everybody. Akos Thomas Novaki, do you have plans in future episodes to expect later campaigns to cover season seven or eight, or perhaps in a few years, uh, the Ori uh, crossover with the Icarus base, things like that? So our hope is obviously that this thing goes really well, and it has been so far. <laughs> so uh, it's been our plan all along to continue down this road uh, with expansions and continued season. Wes has already mentioned that we're talking about we're already planning season, uh, season two of our living campaign. So uh, we're starting at season six, episode nine. Um, we're going to progress the timeline as we go. So as a season goes, um, I think we're doing half seasons in our um makeup i don't want to give too much away but mm. okay yeah I, yeah i wouldn't give too much away yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's be safe <laughs> absolutely and bomber white uh could there be a potential expansion for atlantis as well in the future that yeah Yes, <laughs> there's a potential. There's a potential there's there. A potential there we have to get this one off the ground first though folks so that's right yeah angie e Angie, Angie, uh, will there be any solo missions? Will there be solo missions? Solo missions. So it's, being, it's being group able play. To play it by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want to just sit there and imagine a story for yourself. So, okay. So, uh, I guess <laughs> yeah, the this best way that I could state this would be so, this is Stargate. Um, in many missions and in many episodes of Stargate, you see where the team gets split up, the party is split. Um, so, I could see where a GM could create a mission where his whole party, even though you're sitting, having a, a table of five people sitting in front of you, every member of the party has been split. Um, so they're running their own solo mission for that particular mission at one time. I could see that. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and splitting the party was a really cool thing. So it's not normally Dungeons done, Dragons, right? Dungeons oh, and Dragons, yeah, no. you, that is like a big no, no, you do not split the party, but in Stargate, they do it all the time. You know, the scientist people go and they solve the problem while the, the warrior guys go and hold off the, the replicators, right? Um, and so we wanted to make sure that, that we had a game that could support that. Mm -hmm. And it was really when we, we had the aha moment of, oh, everybody has radios. They right. can just talk They're, to each other. They can other all like talk to normal. each other over comms. They can just, however, like they would normally be at the same table in the same group, mm -hmm. you're still playing together. It's just that you've you physically uh, your characters have split up, so right. it it works works out really well, and um, it's it's really fun, especially in a GM situation, uh, being able to run those those two different things back and forth, and setting the mood and setting the pace of things. Um, and we've got uh, advice for this in our Game Master chapter as well. I can att I attest to the mechanics of that, having uh, played the one for Comic Con, and the soldiers are busy dealing with this creature that exists 
in some kind of space time continuum that's dealing blows to our people. And that's that's a clear across town. And I'm in the local library g- going through books like Daniel, just trying to find a solution to what's mm-hmm. a- attacking these guys. But then once I find the solution, I have to get to them, you know? That's and right. so that was a separate uh, issue entirely, too, because there was something that I had that they physically needed, you know? Yeah. So. And if, but you, all, and if you want all in the meantime, you could relay well, as soon as you find that information in that book, then you could relay it to the team. Hey, guys, you've been doing it all wrong the whole time. This is uh, this is the catch with this. Right. Guy. I can't remember how what the to, situation was, but I had to be they needed me for something. And I ran yeah. and ran. <laughs> and so I it think, took a couple I think turns. Your team actually needed you to help drag some people out. <laughs> That's right. They were falling like left and right. Yeah. Oh, and gosh. Way, if, Only if, fools if rush in. Wanna, if, yes, only fools rush. If people want to watch that episode, it's still available on our YouTube channel. We are linking uh, it below. Game, Wyvern Gaming's YouTube channel. Yeah. Absolutely, and that was a uh, the playtest that uh, David Hewlett was was yeah, in. Yeah, exactly was in right. Well. He was rolling around the as the Una. So that was so funny. Yes. Yeah, uh, taking <laughs> taking a few blows for the team. <laughs> <laughs> the Cancer Man. Would this game possibly tie into the new series Brad Wright is developing? So you guys are okay. a license. Yeah, we're licensed. So we're licensed right. as Stargate SG-1 currently. So everything that we that is in the book today is from content for seasons one through six of Stargate SG-1. Got it. So Any, anything question. Okay. Anything new that's coming out, we would love to be able to partake in it. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I mean, if this is successful, why the heck not, you know? But I think the Atlantis fans would cry foul if you skipped over them. So Probably the so. Pegasus <laughs> Galaxy is rife. So and the Wraith, I can only I mean, the Wraith are a very, you know, potentially Dungeons and Dragons oriented species, you know, for that type Absolutely, of game mechanic. Yeah. I can think of all kinds of things, you know. Yeah. Reduction of life, this and that. Jorge Ares. Uh Spanish translations, other other language translations for the book? So we've been getting this question quite a lot, and we know that global audience fans are everywhere. Um, and it's not currently planned to do a translation. However, it's definitely something that we're strongly considering. Um, Again, this this relies on the success of this Kickstarter. Yeah, it really does. Okay. So, um, right now, the only thing we have planned is the English version. Okay. Okay. So not beyond the realm of possibility, but right now we're getting our ducks in the row for this. Oh yeah, definitely yeah. not beyond the realm. No, we, we're okay. we're we're teeter tottering on whether to push that button. It's well, just that we we need we really really need the push. Right. And then what language do you pick? Support. You know, I mean, yeah. there's a huge German audience. There's a huge French yeah, audience. So like we we may even just do a Kickstarter just by language. That's like, not a bad idea. See, see if the audience is there. The, yeah, just right. to see what the audience size is, because if it's, you know, we, we can't create a book for, you know, a small set of people. Yeah. We, it's got to be a, a decent number of people in order for us to. Right. To, you have to reach a certain critical mass. Yeah. That makes sense. Just to make sure. it viable. So. Yeah. Indie Warners. Will there be a space battle system in the core rule book? I think this is all there ground is, based. Is there? There no, is. Yeah, a, it's, there's, there's space. There's. So inside the. Uh, um, there's an there's a chapter called Encounters. And it's split into two groups. There's plot encounters, which are kind of your your social kind of encounters, the, you know, convincing people and mm. uh, interrogating people and things like that. And then you have your action uh, encounters. And uh, there's some really cool ones. The the one that you would normally think of uh, is in D and D is one we call skirmish. So it's it's played on the on the grid map, and you move your miniatures and you you play within one meter squares. Uh, we have one called Firefight, which is played on 10 meter squares. And it's more of a macro top down view of the, the board where you're shooting, you're having a firefight from a long distance between two set of combatants. So kind of like Battleship? And, no, no. I'm, this is okay. ground battle. So okay, I'm, got it, got it. I'm building to that. <laughs> okay. um, and then we have, uh, we have aerial, aerial combat, which is um, uh, the rules that how to. Uh, have space, uh, not space battles, but uh, death gliders ship. and things like yeah, that. F three hundred two, things like that. Right. It's it's how to it's how to fight in a three dimensional space, Got not it. just the two dimensional plane. On the ground, so right. it, it it works for both uh, within the atmosphere and then also in space. That that same well, mechanic. I, w- I would say that 
what the rules that we have are more for in atmosphere stuff um simply because really the um where we are in this in the show space battles have exactly. not really come about so in perhaps one of our expansions uh yeah. we will we will expand on that for space battles but or so space combat the mechanics of that exist out there for you to adapt Right. So yeah. the mechanic, the mechanics are there. However, the ships aren't necessarily there yet. Uh, well, we they weren't. We, we have... had Prometheus. We didn't even have Prometheus off the ground yet. Co- so correct. Just the X three hundred two. So it was just an experiment. So while and it the failed. mechanic is there, yeah. it's just that you won't be able to. Yeah. I mean, unless you create your own uh, Prometheus, then you know that's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and space com space combat acts a little different than in atmosphere combat. Okay. Just slightly. Benjamin shrank. I'm on Kickstarter, and I noticed it said the gamer's bundle does not include the physical miniatures. Where is the option to include those miniatures? Uh, great question. So that is a stretch goal that has not even yet been revealed. Uh, but you heard it, heard it here first on Dial the Gate, folks. Yep. So <laughs> um, as we unlock more and more stretch goals, we reveal uh, the right. next set, set of them. And uh, we do have some stretch goals lined up, planned for physical miniatures. So um, that was we had a lot, a lot of backers who were asking for um, kind of a, a, a bundle, if you will, uh, pledge level. So um, there was some things that we had to make sure that it made sense economically for us and, and for everyone. So we created the bundle, but we had to put in some caveats uh, in it, and it's that you there's a the Phoenix, the Phoenix site season, uh, the I'm sorry, the Living Series uh, season pass and physical miniatures, if and when they get unlocked, uh, won't be in the bundle that, that he's talking about. Okay, yeah, I mean, if you're going to do a physical game, you got to have yourself a, you know, you got to have yourself a Stargate. So I mean, come on. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Now, no, but speaking of miniatures, there are some stretch goals that we have on here for. Uh, digital STL files, which ah. if you know what those are, those are the files that you need to get things 3D printed. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you can take those files and there are services online, or if you have a 3D printer at home, you'll be able to uh, use the files to, to, to print. Um, we have uh, our Iconics uh, characters that is currently revealed, and there could be more, maybe. Very cool. Guys, that is, I think, everything from the fan base. So do you have anything else that you would like to add before I cut you loose? Is there anything that you say, wanted covered? I just wanted to say thank you to you, David. You've you've been a um you've been with this project since the very start. Like like really the very start. Right. And and it, you've been uh, always a, a voice of reason. Anytime we we are like, how do you spell the tack gun? You're like there for us. <laughs> tack you and tack a minute to run, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, and and as he mentioned before, uh, David was gracious enough to, to give us a foreword for the book. So you'd be looking forward to reading that as part of the uh, uh, the, the game. I, Wes, go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank uh, all of our followers and our fans and uh, our play testers. Um, I mean, it's just the 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 Stargate uh, fan base is just a wonderful fan base. Um, I mean, I, I haven't met or come across anybody that I haven't enjoyed talking to. Yeah, I have sure. to say I cannot speak highly enough about you guys in terms of how much you care about the IP and the integrity of the IP. As actual fans yourselves, you get it. It wasn't just like let's just throw in the Knox or, you know, yeah. it wasn't that the power of the Knox kept you from using the Knox. It's that the, right. the who the Knox are made it um, not well suited for the game. And you could have done it, you know, anyway, I think probably MGM would probably oh, stopped you, but yeah, you, by, you, by all means, like you said earlier, we could have made a rogue faction of the Knox. Right. And, but, but that's not, you know, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. sense. 
So, and that level of detail that you have been giving the the project uh, and coming to me with those those like kinds of questions like that, like the the name for the the staff weapon, the Matok staff weapon, and little things like that. And going we're going back and forth over those conversations and weighing the pros and cons about okay, what actually exists. Um, on screen, what is it that the novels or any of the other ancillary content has done? What is it that the fans don't even know about and wouldn't really care about? Um, and and just balancing out a good game, I've been Absolutely. really impressed, and I'm yep. I am so excited that the project is uh, has come as far as it has on Kickstarter in the short time that it's been online. We are too, and and thank you to all our backers and. Um, if, if you're listening to this, please share our project to other Stargate fans. You know, um, it's I know there's more of you out there uh, that, that would love this game. If you have a gamer friend that uh, you kind of might like to watch Stargate, I think that they would really enjoy this game. So please share it with your friends. I think they'll get a real kick out of it. And we have no excuse now with tools like Zoom and everything else. These these free services that we have. We're at a point right now where, the, I mean, the stratospheric levels of depression and anxiety and everything else that's going on. And where there's a will, there's a way. We have the oh, tools yeah, yeah. available now to communicate with one another online, to provide ourselves a little bit of entertainment. And, you know, it's makes it can make all the difference. Absolutely. And yeah, I look forward to playing role, this with my friends. I can't say enough good things about role-playing games in general. It it really takes people who who might normally have trouble communicating with others and uh it really opens like opens up their just opens up their imagination yeah. and a lot of times it is the for foray into um having a better life having friends having having different things that 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 you're not necessarily used to doing a role-playing game um really is just magical and, and combining it with sci-fi it just makes a lot of sense yeah, I've seen I've seen some huge transfer, transformations on a table. You you would know a person for years that have never played a role playing game, and then they go through and they create this character, and they're like, wow, they just created this character that is totally not like them. And then to see them actually play this character, it's like, well, I never knew you were like that, and they didn't know they were like that either. An aspect of they themselves just, that just doesn't get exercised. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yeah. And and. Some of some of people may may think role playing is acting. I just want to make also make this clear: you do not have to necessarily you don't have to dress up, although that's fun. You don't have to speak in character. You don't have to do any of that stuff, unless you want to. It's it's a really fun thing to do at the table, but it's not necessarily it's not necessary. It's an optional thing. You can you can just play your character as 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 in third person. Uh, that and a lot of people do that. Um, but you can play it in a first person type of uh, mindset. And it's really up to you, however you want to play it. You can even have a, a mix of players at your table that's doing it in, in different ways. And it's okay. It's perfectly fine. So if you're, if you're just afraid of playing the game because you think that it's, it's, it's kind of weird or it's like kind of a LARPy kind of thing that, that maybe it's not something that, that is, is something, a style that you could, you could adapt um, you can still try this and do what's comfortable to you and you're going to have a lot of fun with it. Absolutely. As long as you're willing to uh, follow the same rules that are laid out in the mechanics and are allow, allow, uh, and are willing to share a theater of the mind space, mm -hmm. you can do anything that you want with it. It's imagination. Yep, yeah. you know? imagination. And we, we can all do that So because yep, we were that's... all once children. <laughs> that's right. Guys, it's like playing art. It's like playing army men on your. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, your Brad Wes, thank you. This oh, thank this you. was fantastic. I appreciate you guys being on. All the best success. I think it's going to do gangbusters, and I think that the folks in here um, uh, were, are going to definitely help us spread the word. So, and I look forward to seeing uh, to talking with you guys. Wes, are you going to be uh, talking with us next weekend? Uh, I'll be with you next weekend. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I don't want to clutter up the Zoom too much. It's gonna be we'll crazy. Be so yeah, I'm not even there. playing now. It's like if I can trade myself out for a Stargate actor, I'm sorry guys, but I'm gonna I've got to do it. <laughs> I'm gonna take one for the team. So it's gonna be so cool to watch them play. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a blast. All right, folks. 
Brad Ellis, Wes Walker, Wyvern Gaming. Go to the kickstarter.com website and search for the uh, Stargate SG-1 role-playing game or look for it in the link below. I'm going to have the that as well. The easiest way to get to it, the easiest way oh, to get to it is go to go to stargatertherpg.com and there's a link right there, right at the top of the page. I'm, okay, very good. And I'm going to add that as soon as we hang up from this call. So perfect, guys. Thank you so much. Blessings. Stay safe, okay? Be well, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Brad Ellis, Wes Walker from Wyvern. Thanks so much for hanging on, folks. I really appreciate you being there. And uh, I have a little piece of fan art to show you before I let you go. This was submitted by Hito. She provided us the artwork for our first show. And this was the other piece that I really wanted to share. This is an amazing work of art. And I love the wonder on each of the characters' faces. If you go to Hito's website and you take a look, I'll, I'll uh, share, share the link in, uh, in the video below. And you take a look at all the images of SG-1. You see Jack watching over Sam. He's always looking at her. And there's just something that I really love about that. Um, th this art is absolutely magnificent, and I just really want to thank Hito for uh, allowing me the opportunity to show this to fans. Uh, before we go, if you like what you've seen in this episode, I would really appreciate it if you'd click that like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm, and it will definitely help the show grow its audience. We've grown over leaps and bounds this weekend, and I think we're just getting started, so please consider that. Also, uh, if you'd like, share this video with a Stargate friend, and if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe button. If you plan on watching live, I really recommend giving the bell icon a click so you'll be the first to know of any schedule changes, which are going to happen now and then. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on both the Dial, the Gate, and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. The clips are designed to relay specific moments from uh, the specific episodes. That's all I've got for you guys. It has been a whirlwind of a weekend. My thanks to Mr. Tony Amendola, Mr. Joseph Malazzi, Mr. Joe Flanagan, and Mr. Brad Ellis and Mr. Wes Walker. You guys were fantastic. Uh, I cannot thank uh, Jen, and I cannot thank Gategabber enough uh, for my help, uh, for the help that they've provided me as production assistants. Summer, Keith, Tracy, and Ian, you guys are the best. This team has come together so quickly. I really want to to use this platform to show MGM and those like them that the Stargate fan base is thriving. And what this past week has shown is that that is indeed the case. We're not going anywhere. In some ways, we may just be getting started. So I appreciate your time tuning in. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to be back next weekend. And uh, I don't have the... Uh, the guest list built yet for, I was going to show it here. I'm going to post it momentarily. We're going to be starting off next weekend with Mr. Paul McGillian himself, Dr. Carson Beckett from Atlantis. And he is going to be on at 12 noon Pacific time on Saturday, October the 17th. Then co-writer and producer of Stargate, the feature film, Mr. Dean Devlin will be joining us. This is going to be a fantastic hour and a half. Bring your questions. October the 18th, Sunday, we're going to have what we've been mentioning here, the Stargate SG-1 role-playing game gameplay featuring Rodney McKay, David Hewlett, Scara Chlorel, Alexis Cruz, Aiden Ford, Rainbow Sun Franks, Kalel, Simone Bailey, Eli Wallace, David Blue, and Gin, Julie McNiven. Six fantastic actors who have agreed to take part in a simulated Stargate mission. It's going to be pretty cool. I'm going to let you guys go. I've got to get some rest for a weekend. I'm not sure how often I can do that, but I hope you've enjoyed it, and I, I hope it was time well spent. My name is David Reed. Thanks for watching Dial the Gate. I'll see you on the other side.